One, two, three, hit it. Welcome to Season 4 of DIA Connections. For some, it's welcome back. And for those here for the first time, we're glad you found us. If you're curious about the nation's primary manager and producer of foreign military intelligence, DIA Connections is a good place to start. And speaking of starting, we're always trying to come up with a clever way to begin our episodes. The intention is to pique your interest, and we're always on the lookout for that big hook. Like our show about the agency's connection with Top Gun, the Navy's elite advanced fighter weapons school. That one started this way. I gotta give you your dream shot. I'm gonna send you up against the best. You two characters are going to Top Gun. For the show about DIA's contributions to a nuclear arms treaty, humor was the theme. The laughs came courtesy of President Ronald Reagan and Russian comedian Yakov Shmirnov. Two fellows in the Soviet Union were walking down the street, and one of them says, have we really achieved full communism? Is this it? Is this now full communism? And the other one said, oh, hell no, it's, things are going to get a lot worse. <laughs> what surprises me, American people don't know we have comedy in Russia. We have comedians, they're there. They're dead. <laughs> Good thing about doing comedy in Russia, you have captured audience. <laughs> they're not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, the hook for this show was easy because it's about DIA's cultural property protection mission. Wait, that's not the hook. The hook is one of America's favorite actors, Mr. George Clooney. It's a hard thing when you're doing a movie about saving art. doesn't really sound all that fun. Clooney starred in The Monuments Men. We've been tasked with the finding and protecting of over five million pieces of stolen artwork. It's a true story of men and women who risk their lives in a race against time to avoid the destruction of 1,000 years of culture. What we're talking about isn't just, you know, these paintings on a wall that some people can look at and get and some can't. It's about culture. It is about these monuments and it is about these sculptures, but it's also just about the fabric of our culture and, and our history. You know, it is mankind's way of recording history. At the Defense Intelligence Agency, we play a starring role in that same mission every day. Okay, George, give us the last line. What are you fighting for if it's not for your culture and your life? Now that's a good hook. And this is DIA Connections. My personal approach when it comes to educating soldiers about heritage is mission support. Here is how the information that I can offer you can support your mission and possibly even save your life out there. I think ISIS and the destruction of cultural heritage was a good reminder for the entire community why we needed to protect these sites. Not content with robbing people of their freedom and their lives, the Nazis tried to make off with their symbols of culture. And when the Monuments Men set off on what we now know was the greatest treasure hunt in history, they found millions and millions of objects in thousands of hiding places. It was Aladdin's cave on steroids. Thanks for joining us on DIA Connections. We're calling this episode Saving the History of the World. In 2014, The Monuments Men came to a theater near you. It's an amazing story of a group of scholar soldiers who, towards the end of World War II, joined the front lines in Europe to find, protect, and return treasures stolen by the Nazis. The movie featured George Clooney and Matt Damon. You want to get into the war? Monuments Men. I'm to put a team together and do our best to protect buildings, bridges, and art before the Nazis destroy everything. Bill Murray, John Goodman, and Kate Blanchett rounded out the all-star cast. You have a group of the most accomplished actors in the world who can pretty much do any project they want to, and they all wanted to do this one because they thought this was an important story about the men and women who protected the arts, which, of course, is the foundation of how they make their career. That's author Robert Edsel. The Monuments Man was an adaptation of his book. 
I wrote the book to get a film made because I thought it was the most exciting story I'd ever heard. And I still feel that way. Later in the show, we'll talk more with Robert about the exploits of these courageous men and women and their commitment to protect the greatest cultural and artistic achievements of civilization. In the first three seasons of DIA Connections, we've discussed aspects of the agency that might be somewhat surprising to most, like DIA's vital role in the POW MIA mission, and how we helped track illegal substances like fentanyl from coming into the country, as well as our efforts in the rescue and recovery operations of civilian hostages. And I have a feeling we're going to surprise you again when you listen to DIA historian Paul Isaacson with Liz Saunders. She's a branch chief from the Defense Resources and Infrastructure Office, and they'll discuss DIA's cultural property protection mission. Liz, can you just give us the thumbnail sketch of the general overview of what your cultural protection office does? In the Operational Environment Division, we have the unique mission set of protecting cultural property, and that falls under our no-fail mission of protecting no-strike entities worldwide. Does that mean that you're getting information from various sources around the world of what not to strike? Yes. So that definitely means things that we shouldn't strike, but then it's also used for consideration. So if we were to strike something nearby, that we would limit any collateral damage to those sites. Our work serves as the source of record for our IC and combatant command partners. Is DIA out there on its own just figuring this out or do we have partners? No, we definitely work with partners all over the world, including both within the intelligence community and external to that, such as um, private institutions or even for us, U.S. institutions like the Smithsonian. So all these people, everybody in the community and outside the intelligence community help feed us this information so that we can then put it into the database to protect it. The U.S. has always had a duty to help protect cultural sites. That's stated in the preamble of the multilateral treaty known as the 1954 Hague Convention. Here's what it says. Quote, Any damage to cultural property, irrespective of the people it belongs to, is a damage to the cultural heritage of all humanity, because every people contributes to the world's culture. Did you have to learn about what these potential areas might be or how to choose them or how to appreciate them? Yeah, great question. So in most cases, we do not always have the background in history or archaeology, which is why we depend on our partners to help fill that gap. I personally have a master's in ancient and classical history and a minor in art history. So understanding the importance of these cultural sites and their protection is a passion of mine. Liz, there was an example from, I believe it was 2016 in Iraq, where Google definitely would not have helped us, that your group really had to have some specialized knowledge on something really, really important. Can you you tell us about that story? Yes. So in 2016, like you mentioned, there were observations of Mosul happening during the liberation campaigns and it showed like a large group of people congregating around a sidewalk outside of Mosul Stadium. So it turns out that the people were out paying homage to the site of the Tomb of the Girl, which is a tomb venerated by many local Iraqis. Historians believe the tomb is from the 12th or 13th century. However, it was destroyed by ISIS in June of 2014. But even though the tomb was no longer physically there, it continued to be a site of cultural significance. So as a result of these observations, we kept that site in the database to ensure that the protection continues. Amazing. You know, just hearing about them going to Palmyra and different places and how statues and sculptures and ancient cities were at risk and they were blowing things up. I'll be honest, I, I was enraged. I felt rage. I felt sadness for our world. I thought, my gosh, if they do this, you, you can't bring it back, you know? Yeah, I felt the same way. Yeah, I mean, did you have a similar reaction too, Liz? Yes, I definitely did. And it was interesting because I was deployed at the time around 2014 when ISIS was beginning to emerge in Afghanistan. 
And then again, I was deployed to Iraq in 2017 and just seeing the destruction either from the Taliban or from ISIS on some of these cultural sites. I think when you're on the ground, you get a better idea of the impact to the local populations. And then when I came back home and I saw all the like news reporting and just how upset everyone was because of the destruction of some of these sites, that it really hits home and it angers a lot of people, rightfully so. The work that you do is so vital. I mean, how do you feel about that or what do you think about that as you go about this mission, just knowing how important it is? Uh, That's why I love this mission. It is so vital and it is so necessary, but it's also very interesting. We spend time kind of getting our history nerd on and we're able to like figure out things with communities of experts. So it's a really fun place to be. And we know that there's a direct impact for the work we're doing. It's not just the Defense Intelligence Agency that's dedicated to this mission. Thousands around the world work to preserve the past. One person in particular has collaborated with DIA many times, and we want you to know about the work she does. I'm Dr. Lori Rush. I'm an archaeologist and cultural resources manager serving here at Fort Drum, New York, in support of the 10th Mountain Division. Lori's commitment to the protection of heritage sites began in 2003. It was because of the United States-led coalition called Operation Iraqi Freedom. Good evening. Almost 48 hours into the battle, the war advances with startling speed tonight. This is the scene in Baghdad now, hours before daybreak on Saturday morning in that part of the world. This was shock and awe. Thousands of miles from Iraq in upstate New York, shock and awe took on an entirely different meaning. It was a sense of real frustration and disappointment and the idea that we have to be able to do better. The emotion that Lori expressed wasn't about the initial invasion. It was because of the unintended consequences of what happened in the weeks that followed. I was driving to work one morning listening to National Public Radio. And they were reporting on damage at the iconic city site of Babylon. Babylon, the ancient capital of King Nebuchadnezzar, is easily the most famous of Iraq's historic sites. Over the millennia, it has suffered damage from time and nature. And more recently, the damage from coalition forces who dug trenches while using it as a base. Then came news of looting at the National Museum of Iraq. 5,000-year-old tablets bearing some of the first known writing, the first known calendar, and the 5,000-year-old Warka vase, which shows a procession entering a temple, the earliest known depiction of a ritual. By the time I got to the office, I was ready to call my team together. And I said, listen, guys, we support the most deployed division. We are sending soldiers to Iraq. We need to be sure that our soldiers have the kind of education and training. And so we began our overseas heritage education and training programs for military personnel. Lori wears many hats at Fort Drum. She's an archaeologist, anthropologist, Native American Affairs Liaison, and Cultural Property Protection Trainer. Thanks for joining us, Lori. Before we talk about the programs that you implemented and your connection with DIA, can you tell us about being an archaeologist with the Army? I think that plenty of people would be surprised to learn that there's even such a job. Why does the Army have archaeologists? You're absolutely right. People are often very surprised to learn that the Army hires archaeologists. The Army does a lot of interesting digging and military training that involves a lot of ground disturbance. We want to be sure that we get our archaeology team out there to make sure that the important places are identified and saved while uh, opening lands for our military missions. Iraq was the catalyst for your programs that educate soldiers about cultural heritage. And I'm guessing that one of the challenges that they have is deploying to places with cultures that are unfamiliar to them. 
that is the biggest challenge. And that's one area where we really try to design our educational programming. What does heritage look like? What does archaeology look like? And when there are situations where unfamiliar soldiers don't recognize that perhaps the pointed rock in the middle of the valley is not just a rock. It's the tooth of the dragon slain by Hazrat Ali to make the valley safe for the Hazara people. Imagine if by mistake someone were to hit it with a military vehicle and they might never know why everyone was so angry. It took thousands of years to build this civilization, but just a few to wreck it. But now, is And under- if we don't need to add tension and anger to the situation, I think the whole mission can go so much more smoothly. Can you talk about situations where showing the proper respect to a cultural site might affect the mission's success? I was actually briefing a group of soldiers who had already been to Iraq and come home. We were having a discussion of cemeteries and the importance of respecting other people's burial sites. And I had a picture I had found on the internet of an Iraqi cemetery. And I said to the soldiers, just because this cemetery looks abandoned, you still need to respect it. And the soldier said to me, ma'am, that's not an abandoned cemetery. That's a shot up cemetery. And another soldier said, what do we do when they're shooting at us from the cemeteries? Is it okay to shoot back? And I was so surprised by the question. And I said, absolutely, yes. And then one of the soldiers said, ma'am, you're our kind of archaeologist. That seems like a pretty good example of education going both ways. It was the soldiers who taught me that our adversaries were actually using heritage and cultural property for tactical advantage. And as a result, we began to ramp up our uh, training opportunities even more so that our soldiers would be ready for those kinds of challenges. So teaching respectfulness of their surroundings, but also knowing when the terrain could be dangerous. So it's kind of dual purpose training. Oh, there's no question about it. Do... Any examples come to mind that would illustrate that? My personal approach when it comes to educating soldiers about heritage is mission support. Here is how the information that I can offer you can support your mission and possibly even save your life out there. Another excellent example are the ancient water systems of Afghanistan. We have these series of tunnels that run for miles and miles that carry the water. These tunnels have access points to the surface. And if you're a soldier and you don't realize what that hole in the ground actually represents, you could be very easily taken by surprise by an adversary. Sometimes when we think about features in the landscape, we need to be thinking about What is it hiding? What might be under the the ground? And how can we tell using aerial imagery or using basic information that archaeologists have been gathering for years to help you understand that landscape better and also to anticipate potential threats? NATO's mission in Libya ended last month, completing one of the most successful air campaigns in the history of the alliance. The campaign was also successfully carried out without any serious damage to Libya's ancient heritage sites. In 2011, the situation in Libya was dire, and the threat to the region's antiquities was grave. That's when Lori's mission, as well as DIA's, strengthened. DIA is one of my very favorite agencies, and our relationship goes back to 2011. It was during the course of Operation Unified Protector in Libya where we had colleagues from the U.S. and the U.K. put together a non-lethal target list for the ancient Roman city sites along the Libyan coastline. That list was implemented very effectively to the point 
where precision weapons were used to actually remove radar that Gaddafi had actually put on ancient Roman fortifications. And we were able to remove that radar without damaging the fort. Remember earlier when Lori spoke about Iraq in 2003? That was the year we created a deck of playing cards with photos of the most wanted in Saddam Hussein's regime. We did a podcast about it. And this deck of cards is one example of what we provide to soldiers and Marines out in the field with the faces of the individuals and what their role is. The cards became a very sought-after intelligence tool for the troops on the ground and an inspiration for Lori. Our single greatest success in terms of soldier education is our archaeological awareness playing cards for military personnel. We have used actual photographs of actual artifacts and features on all of our cards. The diamonds, the messages were all about artifacts. The hearts were about winning hearts and minds. The clubs were about cultural preservation. And the spades, my personal favorite was how to be careful when you're digging. I guess imitation really is the sincerest form of flattery. We thought our last question to Lori would make for a really smooth transition to our next guest, Robert Etzel. His book, The Monuments Men, became the movie The Monuments Men. We asked Lori about her favorite movie, and we assumed that her favorite movie would be about safeguarding the history of the world. But we were wrong. I know that Robert Edsel is going to be on the show, so it's a little bit embarrassing to say that. No, The Monuments Men probably is not my favorite movie. I would probably go back to Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and in part because I've had the opportunity to visit Petra and be able to actually see those amazing places for myself. So whenever I can connect a movie to my real life, I just feel beyond fortunate. Well, Indiana Jones was an archaeologist. So I guess we should have seen that one coming. Robert Etzel started the Monuments Men and Women Foundation in 2007. It was a time when only a few scholars knew anything about them. Later that year, President Bush acknowledged their achievements at a White House ceremony. It is now my privilege to present the National Medals of Art and the National Humanities Medals. Once again, I congratulate... They were honored again in 2015 when they received the highest civilian honor bestowed by the United States, the Congressional Gold Medal. Here's the Honorable Nancy Pelosi. But thanks to the Monument Men, the war that claimed so much, that took the lives of so many, would not also destroy the creativity that connects us to the heritage of civilization. With the last living Monuments Men and Women among us, we stand in the presence of greatness. These unsung heroes from World War II have finally received their proper recognition. Much of the credit goes to Robert Etzel, who's taken on the role of messenger for the group. And that seems unlikely when you consider how his professional career began. At one time, he was a nationally ranked tennis player. He was also a successful pioneer in the oil and gas exploration business. But he was searching for, in his words, a more meaningful life. His quest began when he moved to the jewel of the Renaissance, Florence, Italy. The region's rich cultural history took hold of him. He began learning all that he could about his surroundings. Art and architecture became his passion. Then, one day while walking on the oldest stone bridge in Europe, something gnawed at him, which would eventually blaze a path for his future life's work. I was on the Ponte Vecchio Bridge one day, which was the only bridge not destroyed by the Nazis in August 1944 when they fled north. And I wondered, well, with 65 million people killed during World War II and and massive destruction throughout Europe, how did so many works of art and monuments survive and who were the people that saved them? And what did you discover? Who were the saviors of the world's greatest masterpieces? Well, the monuments men were, and women, were 
museum curators, directors, art historians, professors, architects, librarians who volunteered for military service during World War II when they never would have been drafted. Most of them were in their late 30s, early 40s. They had established careers. Many had families, some had kids. Yet they felt they had a contribution to make in the war, and it was to become a new kind of soldier, one charged with saving, not destroying. No one had tried to do something on a comprehensive basis, like putting cultural preservation officers into the Army. These experts who had no Army training before volunteering and embed them with troops. And how many of them were there? There were just a handful of them initially, about a dozen to begin with in 1943 in Italy and a few dozen in Western Europe. The Nazis tried to eradicate the Jews from Europe. But as Edsel explains, what happened prior would be a harbinger. The murdering of people is not the first step. It's the destruction of their cultural heritage. It's the humiliation part. That's the part that I think oftentimes, even today, is still overlooked. What they're trying to do is break down the people there and destroy whatever it is that they are believing in. Not content with robbing people of their freedom and their lives, the Nazis tried to make off with their symbols of culture. Anything that had value was targeted by the Nazis for looting. They were removed and put on trains and trucks back to Germany, hidden in salt mines, caves, and castles. The castle of Neuschwanstein, overlooking Fussen, housed a great part of the art treasure stolen by the Nazis. Prize thief among the high Nazis was Hermann Goering, who looted museums and private collections in all parts of Europe. Much was hidden in caves. What's exceptional about World War II is the looting wasn't just incidental to war, it was premeditated looting. The Nazis had German curators in museums years before the war started making lists of things they intended to loot once the war started. In a mountain cave near Berchtesgaden, Goering's secret treasure trove was located by American soldiers. And when the Monuments men set off on what we now know was the greatest treasure hunt in history, they found millions and millions of objects in thousands of hiding places. It was Aladdin's cave on steroids. Included in Robert's book are letters to loved ones back home from the Monuments Men. They include touching sentiments about separation, along with expressions of glee derived from locating priceless links to history. One letter reads, The last few days have been the most incredible of my whole life. For instance, I was able to see a place where the greatest art treasures of Western Germany are hidden. Another letter states, I have run down the most exciting information and documents on the wholesale looting of art in Europe by the Nazis and finding treasures such as I have rarely expected to find. Robert, what are some of the most famous masterpieces found? The big three we talk about are Leonardo's Lady with an Ermine, uh, Rembrandt, Portrait of a Good Samaritan, and a self-portrait by Raphael. But so many of the other things were destroyed. In the West, they intended to occupy these countries. So there was no rush in, in looting things out of museums because the Reich's going to last a thousand years. But some things that were important to them to loot out of museums and churches, they did take right away. The Ghent altarpiece was probably the most famous and important. The Bruges Madonna from Bruges in Belgium was also taken. But if it wasn't for people, many of whose names we'll never know, that took preliminary measures to try and protect things as much as they could by putting scaffolding up to protect them, like the Last Supper in Milan, None of us would be looking at anything other than a black and white photo of a painting that once existed on a wall in a refectory in Milan because it would have been rubble, well beyond anyone's capacity to reconstruct. It would just be a horrific loss because I give so much credit to General Eisenhower and, and General Marshall and President Roosevelt that authorized them to do this that the freedom of the human spirit and human mind, which has produced the world's great art, 
shall not be utterly destroyed. If you walked into any major museum in the United States and went to look at the very best works of art that they've got, Americans would be astonished to know how many of the most famous things were during World War II in a salt mine somewhere found by the Monuments Men. While we must and will win this war, we should also remember the high price that will be paid if the very foundation of modern society is destroyed. And action! The book was a number one New York Times bestseller, and turning it into a movie would find a larger audience, especially if George Clooney directed and starred in it. I'm going to have a reverse, I'm going to have it closer, so let me, let me get something wider that I get to... Robert, Tell me about collaborating with Clooney. Did he have knowledge of the subject, or did you have to get him up to speed? Let's just both go on record so we keep George on our good side. He doesn't need lots of tutorials. He's a really smart guy. Exactly right. We already know that he's stealing art out of Warsaw, out of Amsterdam. He had done an enormous amount of homework. They already had storyboards up with their vision of how the story might be told. You want to go into a war zone with some architects and artists and tell our boys what they can and cannot blow up. That's right. You sit down with a guy who is, I don't know, and maybe among the 20 most famous people in the world. And it was going fine for the first few minutes. And then he smiled at something somebody said and the wattage of the star power emerged very quickly and you are at a pinch me moment thinking, you know, damn, I'm sitting here with George Clooney, the George Clooney. Some of the most important works of art were never found by the Monuments Men. Their whereabouts remain a mystery, but the hunt for them continues. To aid the search, the Foundation created a most wanted deck of playing cards that feature artworks and cultural objects that are still missing. A testament to the Monuments Men's legacy is the passing of the torch to people like Dr. Lori Rush and to DIA officers. There's also a newly established Army Reserve Civil Affairs training program. They're known as Monuments Officers, and a new collaboration between the U.S. Army and the Smithsonian Institution is expanding their numbers and capabilities in time of war. Their mission... The Army, several years ago, announced that they would be reconstituting the Monuments Men and Women Force, and I delivered the commencement address for the first graduating class of 21st century Monuments Officers. You follow in the footsteps of a group of scholars, archivists, artists, librarians, who 80 years ago were tossed into the chaos of a world war with pitifully few resources, and a mission that they largely designed and implemented on the fly. There will be many things you cannot control, but you must be resolute in communicating to commanders the importance of protecting cultural treasures wherever our fighting forces go. Before we go, here are some final thoughts about the mission to save the history of the world. First up, here again is Dr. Lori Rush, archaeologist and cultural resources manager in Fort Drum, New York. We have so many colleagues that are risking their life every day trying to protect the objects in their museums or trying to keep a library hidden and in a safe place until the conflict is over. I'm always so touched, too, when a conflict ends and suddenly we discover these people who emerged from a hiding place with the intact library that they risked their life to save. And those people keep me motivated. And here's Liz Saunders from DIA's Cultural Property Protection Mission. If DIA didn't do this, I have a hard time imagining what the collateral damage would look like all over the battle space, no matter where it is worldwide. It would definitely impact local populations and conflict areas. And as we've learned from history time and time again, what happens when you don't consider local traditions and culture? So it's very hard to imagine what would happen. And lastly, here are words of two original monuments men. The first is from Private Harry Ettinger, U.S. 7th Army. 
A German Jew, Ettinger fled Nazi persecution in 1938, and he was drafted by the army after graduating high school. Prior to his passing in 2018, he said this. We human beings need culture around us. We cannot live in a world with white walls. It needs to be around us to make life more meaningful, more enjoyable. Lieutenant George Stout was portrayed by George Clooney in the movie. Stout was instrumental in convincing the museum community and the Army toward establishing the Professional Art Conservation Corps. He said this about the moral argument for having cultural preservation officers. Quote, To safeguard these things will not affect the course of battles, but it will affect the relations of invading armies with those people and their governments. To safeguard these things will show respect for the beliefs and customs of all men, and will bear witness that these things belong not only to a particular people, but also to the heritage of mankind. As always, thanks for listening to DIA Connections.